Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started uh, with our next presentation. And to introduce uh, Senator Warren, we have Ms. Siemens. Hello. I'm Barb Siemens, co-executive director of Four Directions, and I'd like to introduce Elizabeth Warren. Who <laughs> Thank you for coming. Hello, Senator Warren. Um, we're going to uh, have you provide a brief statement, three to five minutes, and then we're going to turn it over to our panelists who are going to ask uh, several questions, and we understand that you have to uh, run, and then we're going to uh, have your surrogates fill in for you with the rest of the panel and the questions. So let's get it right into it. Welcome. All right, well, thank you so much. I, I appreciate it, and thank you, Barb, for the introduction. I appreciate it. You know, I, I want to also say a thank you as we're doing this uh, to two members of my team who are there with you, I think, right now, Ryan Ramirez and Amber Torres. And of course, as you know, Amber is chairman of the Walker River Paiute Tribe, and I'm so grateful to have a chance to work with both of them and most of all to learn uh, from both of them. You know, I, I was so glad to have the chance to participate in the Frank Lemire Forum last year. It was inspiring, it was illuminating, and so I'm very glad to have this chance to participate again today. I, I want to start by recognizing four directions and the many partners you have for all of the hard work that's gone into organizing these two forums. I know a forum is not easy to put together, and you have done a tremendous job of elevating Indian country's priorities as we go into the 2020 election. And I just, I had soft, you know, it's really powerful. I am so grateful for the many, many conversations that I've had with tribal leaders and other native representatives. It has been a huge honor to be able to partner with Indian country on so many critical issues. And that's what I have tried to do as a Senator. And that's what I promise I will do as president. You know, I hope you will all take a look at the plan I released last year for honoring and empowering tribal nations and indigenous peoples. It calls for bold structural change to federal government's relationship with Indian country. I think we have an opportunity to reset that relationship and to work with Indian country in much more significant ways. I consider the federal government's trust and treaty obligations to tribal nations to be sacred. It is time for the federal government to recognize its ongoing broken promises to Indian country. And that is why I am working with my friend and the co-chair of my presidential campaign, Congresswoman Deb Holland. Um, we're putting together legislation on that and moving forward. Um, another feature that I just want to point out to you all is that as president, it is my intention to make a permanent cabinet level White House counsel position on Native American affairs. I'm hoping that this will revitalize the nation to nation relationship between the tribal nations and the federal government because Indian country deserves a seat in the highest positions of my administration. Um, we'll secure also uh, full funding. This is another part of what I wanna do, full guaranteed funding for native housing, for healthcare, for economic opportunity, for education, for public safety, for infrastructure. Um, we have made so many promises that we have failed to follow through on as a nation. We also will address the crisis of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls by strengthening the native provisions in the Violence Against Women Act. And in my native plan, I call for us to go even further 
and adopt an Oliphant fix to recognize the inherent jurisdiction of tribal nations to protect their people from all perpetrators, native and non-native alike. Uh, during my time as president, I want to pass the Native American Voting Rights Act and make sure that Native people have full and equal access to American democracy. Now, as Senator, I've already been working hard for Indian country. Um, I have co-sponsored, I think the latest count is 55 pieces of legislation to help Native people, including a bill to reauthorize the Violence Against Women Act with strong tribal provisions in it. I have also introduced legislation of my own for Indian country. Those include bills like the Native American Suicide Prevention Act, um, a bill to help treat and prevent child abuse in Indian country, and my housing bill, which would provide a huge boost to the Native American Housing Assistance and Self-Determination Act. You know, and so many of these, not enough to make a promise. You gotta have the money to back it up. Um, my campaign plans regularly uh, include tribal provisions from my democracy reform plan to my child care plan to my Blue New Deal proposal to restore our oceans. I have worked hard to consult with Native peoples and with tribal leaders, and I'm going to continue to do that work as president. The vision I have laid out is big and it's bold, but I really do believe that together we can get this done and that the federal government can finally live up to its obligations to the tribal nations. I, I just want to say to all of you, I am so grateful for the many conversations that we have and how much the message that comes from Indian country is one of resilience and one of hope. I believe that together we can make big structural change so that everyone has a chance to build a strong future. That's why I'm running for president and that's why I hope to have your support. Thank you, Senator. So, so we're gonna jump right into the Q&A. And, and one of our, our values as indigenous people is the importance of youth. So let's lead with uh, the youngest person, our youth representative on the panel, Ms. Bentleon. As president, how will you ensure sacred sites are protected and tribes are consulted prior to any permitting a cures for pipelines or energy development? So thanks so much for asking that question. Uh, and I know how powerfully important it is. This is truly about your, your future. My plan for honoring and empowering tribal nations uh, lays this out in some detail. And I hope if you have a chance, go to a elizabethwarren.com and just take a look if you want to look at more of the details, but let me lay it out overall. Um, my plan is that during my presidency, my guiding principle will be that unless the tribal nations impacted have given their free, prior, and informed consent, the federal government will reject new projects and decisions that would significantly affect a tribal community their land, their resources, or their religious practices. In other words, the tribal nation decides. And I will revoke the ill-advised, and in my view, improperly granted permits for Keystone XL and for the Dakota Access Pipelines. As a senator, I have been a strong defender of sacred sites I've taken steps to protect Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante National Monuments. I'm an original co-sponsor of a bill to save Oak Flat in Arizona, and I've backed uh, legislation to protect the Chaco Canyon in New Mexico. <coughs> Excuse me. In Washington, 
we got to stop putting the interests of companies that want to exploit our environment ahead of the interests of Native people who seek to preserve their homelands and their sacred sites. I also want to say, since you're in Nevada, let me, let me just mention another part. I've opposed military expansion into the Desert National Wildlife Refuge. I believe we have a responsibility to protect these lions, the lions and to respect the communities and the heritage that they represent. Uh, just this morning, I also called out the US Navy for failing to meaningfully consult and work with the Fallon Paiute Shoshone tribe um, as the Navy is trying to expand the Naval Air Station Fallon. And I, on this one, I want to acknowledge the Walker River Paiute tribe and the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe and the Yumba Shoshone tribe and all of the other members of the Intertribal Council for Nevada for being so actively engaged in this. You all really made a difference here. You helped us understand and uh, gave us the background that we needed so that we could become engaged and try to help you as well. I hope that's helpful. Absolutely. And I want to make sure that, that Ms. Bet-Leon gets to uh, talk about where she's from as well, because I think that's important. Um, my name is Adrian bet -Leon, and I'm from the Uglala Sioux Tribe on the Pioneer Gener Reservation. And I am in seventh grade at Islami Chawaiwa. Awesome. Another one of our, our very important virtues is indigenous peoples also um, honoring our elders and those who, who have experience. And I want to call on Wendy, who's one of our, our elder stateswomen of Indian country. Good afternoon, Senator Warren. This is Wendy Helgamo. Very nice to see you again. Um, I'm a citizen of the Ho-Chunk Nation, and I'm of counsel at the Big Fire Lawn Policy Group located in uh, Omaha, Nebraska. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. Um, the question that I have for you is, when you are president, what is your plan to fight the opioid ec epidemic, and how will you ensure tribes have the resources they need to take on the, the crisis? Well, thank you, Wendy, and I'm so glad to have this chance to visit with you again. And I am really glad you asked about opioids because I have a plan for that. Um, during my time in the Senate, I have focused a lot on the opioid crisis. Massachusetts has an epidemic, uh, but I am well aware that Indian country has been especially hard hit by opioids and by other forms of addiction. You know, the Mashpee Wampanoag hosted me for a roundtable about the opioid and addiction crisis. The Choctaw Nation hosted me in Oklahoma for an intertribal roundtable about it too. So I, I'm very grateful to have had these opportunities to hear more about how this crisis has unfolded on the ground. Um, my friend, the late Congressman Elijah Cummings and I introduced a bill called the CARE Act. And it was modeled on the legislation that had successfully been used to tackle the HIV AIDS epidemic. It is a big ambitious bill to provide $100 billion in federal funding over the next 10 years to deal with the cost of the opioid crisis. Because I understand, you know, the problem is not so much we don't know what to do. It's that we have not been willing to put the resources in to be able to fight this and to fight it in all the ways necessary from outreach to get people in for treatment, uh, uh, to give them the kind of treatment they need acutely and then the kind of long-term support that people need. When we were putting this together, it was extremely important to me that tribal nations be included and specifically called out in it. 
So I worked with organizations like the National Indian Health Board and the Seattle Indian Health Board just to make sure we got this right. Um, the CARE Act, instead of just funneling money to the states and hoping that the states will move it on to the tribal nations, the CARE Act invests hundreds of millions of dollars directly into tribal nations and into the urban Indian programs to address the opioid and substance use crisis. You know, I, I learned firsthand from talking with people, you can't just provide this funding to the states and hope that it trickles down to the nations. And that is why my bill provides funding directly from the federal government to Indian country. Um, at those tribal roundtables, I also learned that we shouldn't limit ourselves to opioids because some tribal nations are dealing with other addiction issues like heroin, um, uh, like meth. Uh, so I took that lesson back and Elijah and I worked on the bill again so that we could make sure that our bill would give the tribal nations the flexibility they need so they have the resources directly from the federal government that they need to address this problem. This is an area, we have lost so many of our loved ones. Uh, and I know this has hit Indian country so hard, um, but this is a moment we should have determination. We will tackle this epidemic. I have been in this fight for years. And as president of the United States, I will be in a stronger place to fight. We must fight on behalf of our brothers and sisters who are suffering. Thank you, Senator. Uh, the next question to one of our long, long time political leaders in Indian country, Kevin. Lakota. Shake your hands with a warm and good heart. Uh, Senator Warren, Kevin Killer from South Dakota. I previously served in the South Dakota State Legislature as a senator and state representative for 10 years. And, uh, you know, and thank you for all of you done for our communities and everything. Uh, and, <clears throat> you know, I just want to say thank you too for participating in this forum and making time for this. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, so the question is, being from South Dakota, Ms. me and Ms. Bellion and other members on the panel, we have ancestry. Uh, what will you do to ensure that the 20 medals of honor wrongly given to the perpetrators of the Wounded Knee Memorial, or I'm sorry, Wounded Knee Massacre are revoked? Yes. So I am there. I introduced the Senate version of Remain, Remove the Stain Act. And that is, of course, exactly what it would do. It would remove those medals. Um, as you undoubtedly know, uh, we hit the 129th anniversary of the Wounded Dean Massacre just a few weeks ago. I think it was late December, December 29th. Um, I know there was a panel discussion yesterday on the subject uh, there in Nevada for all of you. you know, the horrifying acts of violence against hundreds of Lakota men, women, children at Wounded Knee is something that should be condemned, not celebrated with medals of honor. The Medal of Honor is granted for gallantry beyond the call of duty. But what happened at Wounded Knee was not gallant. It was not courageous. It was profoundly shameful. The Remove the Stain Act openly acknowledges that. We must never forget what really happened that day. And we should all be working to advance justice and take a step toward righting the wrongs against Native peoples. Part of that is to be honest about our history and to remove those medals of honor. So I am the sponsor of that legislation in the Senate um, and I will press for it as president of the United States. Now, I'd like to get this through now. Um, so I would encourage everyone in this room 
to make your voices heard on this. Ask your senators, call your senators, text your senators, email them. It's the Senate bill number, I have a note here, is um, 3164. So that's S3164. If we could get more co uh, co-sponsors, if we could get more support on this, I'm eager to move this now. We shouldn't have to wait for a change in administrations, but if it has not happened by the time I'm president, I promise I will be on this and pushing hard. Thank Thanks, you, Senator. Thank you. Next question is for Donna. Good afternoon, Senator Warren. My name is Donna Siemens. I am the grassroots organizer for Four Directions. I'm a Rosebud Sioux Tribe. Uh, my question is, is, as president, will you advocate for mandatory spending in Indian country? Uh, you bet I will. Uh, this is, as you know, the Broken Promises Act came out uh, uh, just a little over a year ago and was a reminder of just a catalog of all of the ways that the federal government has failed to follow through on the spending that is required. Um, this was put out by the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. And in my view, it has shown us how chronically underfunded Native programs are in five critical areas, in criminal justice and public safety, in healthcare, in education, in housing, in economic development. Now, I know that the report was no surprise to anybody in this room. I know that it is the lived experience of many people who are here today. And the report just confirmed what you already knew, but that does not make it any less significant. Uh, it is very significant to have it, to have it documented. Uh, it is also deeply troubling. So the report had this line, and I wanna just hold on for a sec here. I wanna quote it because I wanna get it exactly right. The United States expects all nations to live up to their treaty obligations and it should live up to its own. Um, I agree. The broken promises are simply unacceptable. They are a breach of our trust and treaty obligations. And so after this report came out, um, I gave a call to Deb Holland and said, what about working on legislation together so that we partner up and do a proposal that the federal government would honor our promises with full funding. Um, and that proposal includes mandatory full funding for native programs in the five areas that are called for in the Broken Promises Report. It also requires making the White House Council on Native American Affairs permanent in the statute and setting up a new tribal affairs office in OMB so that we know how much of the funding is actually reaching Indian country. So many conversations with so many of you have certainly taught me the lesson. It is not enough that we do the legislation in Congress. We need to track to make sure the money really makes it there. And that's what we're doing in this, in our broken promises bill. Um, Debs and my bill also includes bold steps to promote economic development for tribal nations, including major investments in physical infrastructure, major investments in broadband expansion in Indian country, and capital access through more support for native CDFIs. Um, We've already started receiving a lot of feedback from Indian country on the proposal, and we're working to build on that feedback. You know, I, I wanna say about this, Deb and I were 
made the decision early on when we put this together. We didn't just want to go off in a room by ourselves and write it or write it with our teams. We really wanted to put the basic framework out there and invite uh, the tribal nations, invite uh, experts, invite advocates to step in and say, think about this part, or it looks different from our perspective over here. Here's a piece you should look at. So we've we've started the drafting in a very open textured way. And like I said, we've got some terrific feedback. I wanna thank all of you who've offered it. And for any of you who wanna jump in and do more, take a look at it, please do. We would love to hear from you on this. You know, um, it is ultimately the piece we're putting together is a budget piece. But I always make this point, budgets are a reflection of our values. If the United States truly values honoring its promises to tribal nations, then it needs to do that through its budget. So this is something I'm gonna push hard on and I hope this is something we can all work on together when I'm president. And thank you, Senator. Great. Senator, uh, in your, your remaining time with us, um, do you have anything further that you would like to, to let us know or tell us? Um, the only thing I will add is just to say thank you. Thank you for letting me do this uh, uh, remotely. I wish I could be there in person. I'm deeply grateful for having this ongoing and growing opportunity to work with Indian country. Um, it has meant a lot to me personally to be able to have the opportunities to understand where our federal government has failed so badly, but where there is such opportunity to improve the relationships with our tribal nations. And that's the kind of president I want to be. Um, this matters to me. The notion that we could right a wrong, at least to the extent possible in the 21st century. We can't go back and rework our history, but we can commit together to do better. And that starts with our federal government treating our tribal nations with respect and treating indigenous people with respect. It starts with honoring our trust and treaty obligations. And it starts with the deep reverence for the enormous resilience that our tribal nations and Indian country generally has shown. Um, it has been a real honor to work with you and I look forward to many more years of our working together and of our building a stronger future together. Thank you for having me here today. Um, Rizzi, can I ask a quick question of the senator? Um, senator um, Shannon Atsidi from the Great Navajo Nation. Um, just quickly to get on the record as president, um, would you commit to this group and this body that you will appoint more natives to the federal bench and perhaps to the Supreme Court? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a screenshot. <laughs> It looks like we still have more time. Mr. Fredericks? I, I think we have now two people who are going to, to meet this. I think Ryan is going to do this now. Okay. And well, I, think I, have to, I think I have to be pulled somewhere yeah, else. Best of for luck you. with the rest of the election. Yep. And uh, we're going to let your surrogates uh oh. Take it over from here. <laughs> Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator. Okay. Thank you. All right, guys, do me proud. We'll do our best. Thank you. Okay, Wayne, first, first question to, and, and w maybe before we do that, maybe we have Ryan and Amber just in, quickly introduce yourselves yeah. and, and your role. Yeah. Um, you want to introduce yourself too? 
you didn't do an introduction on the front end either. And for though, uh, my name is Wizipa. <laughs> uh, I'm a uh, member of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe, uh, or as we prefer to call ourselves, the Sichago Lakota Oyate. And uh, I'm just kind of a, a guy hanging out, asking questions, kind of trying to moderate a little bit. But, uh, but yeah, Ryan and Amber. Pija Tabino, me, Amber Torres, me, Nania, no, a guy to cut a point of be, no, a guy, gue. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Amber Torres. I'm the chairman for the Walker River Paiute Tribe in Shures, Nevada. Uh, uh, hello, my friends. Uh, my name is Ryan Ramirez. I'm an enrolled member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians in Belcourt, North Dakota. Um, my, my mother's family is from Belcourt. My father, uh, before he passed, was an enrolled member of the Pasco Yaqui tribe in um, Arizona. And uh, <clears throat> I like to include my wife because she makes me. Um, uh, my, my wife uh, is an enrolled member of the Quinault Indian Nation in um, Washington State, where we live. Her her dad was from Tohola, from the Quinault Indian Nation. Her mom was her mom is absentee Shawnee in Creek from Oklahoma. So we cover a wide breadth of uh, of tribes across across the country. Uh, I currently, sir, I'm here in my individual capacity representing uh, the Warren campaign and uh, standing up for, for Senator Warren, somebody who I have a tremendous amount of respect, love, and reverence in. Um, and my daytime job, I serve as the, the CEO for Port Madison Enterprises, which is the economic development arm of the Suquamish tribe in Washington State. And uh, I also serve as the chairman of the Democratic National Committee's Native American Caucus and have had uh, a tremendous amount of opportunity to sit down with all the candidates and feel like I have a very unique perspective in terms of being able to talk firsthand in terms of sitting down and talking to the candidates in regards to Indian country and their perspectives on Indian country. Excellent. Go ahead, Wayne. How am I talking, Happy? <clears throat> So uh, underneath uh, Warren's campaign, what, what would her initiative be to protect um, ICWA and um, Indian Child Welfare Act? That's something that you know is really under fire nowadays. Uh, when I was an elected official at the tribe, that was something we dealt with. And now that I'm on a human services end um, with my current job, it's something that's coming up now more than ever. Yeah, and I mean, if you don't mind. Uh, in, in terms of the Indian Child Welfare Act, I mean, first and foremost, she's an incredible supporter and understands the commitment that that is to our community. Me on an individual basis in terms of, you know, for me, coming in terms of looking at the candidates, uh, my wife, uh, I, I grew up more urban most of the time. That's a conflict in my house because my wife's a reservation-based Indian, so she likes to remind me that I didn't grow up on the res. So I did spend a lot of time on the res, but I didn't grow up on the res. <laughs> Um, but in terms of, so she's, she's constantly reminding me of, you know, when she was a kid living on the res, that it didn't matter whether you were a Democrat, didn't matter whether you were a Republican, no matter what, nothing changed on the res in terms of who was in office. I mean, I think we saw, uh, you know, with a lot of work from, you know, Weezy, others, myself, in terms of with, with President Obama, I think there was a little bit of a change in that regard in terms of seeing more of an impact within Indian country in, in that regard. So for me, I had uh, my parents in 1966. I had a, they had a kid in high school. My dad um, and mom had a, had a kid that you know that they had to give up through the Catholic Church. In in terms of they couldn't take care of nobody in the family had the ability to take care of them. My dad lived primarily in the rectory in the in the Catholic Church and uh, didn't have the resources to do it. My mom's family didn't have the resources to do it, and we didn't meet that kid until. 15, 10, 15 years ago. And, uh, you know, for me, this is the Indian Child Welfare Act is something that's incredibly personal. personal. And uh, we have since, my brother's name's Kurt. Kurt has since, you know, rejoined the family. He's gotten enrolled in the tribe. He grew up not knowing that he was Indian. And so for, for me, it's important to have a candidate who's committed to, to Indian country in, in that regard. Uh, she, she's been a champion of the Indian Child Welfare Act. She's committed to, to ensuring that, uh, that those uh, 
rights are protected. She was one of the first candidates, she was the first candidate, let me correct that, was the first candidate to issue a statement after the Fifth Circuit affirmed the constitutionality of the Indian Child Welfare Act. She, uh, uh, you know, more recently has signed on to uh, the bill, or not the bill, but the uh, amicus brief in support of the Indian Child Welfare Act in uh, 2018. She also was in the position of being able to be one of the co-sponsors of um, the recognition uh, within the Senate of of the, the 40th anniversary of the Indian Child Welfare Act. And I think as you heard her say today, you know, she's committed to making sure that those justices that she appoint, appoints on the federal bunch, bench, that they understand, she likes to remind me, the, the nation to nation relationship we have between the federal government and and uh, our, our tribal nations, and that she will ensure that, that those people she appoints understand that and are, and are equally committed to that along the lines of, that she is. Okay, thank you. Marlon? Yes, my question's on the, uh, uh, the White House Tribal Nations Conference. How will uh, Warren, the Warren administration uh, host White House Tribal Nations Conference and how do you plan to engage tribal leaders on issues impacting their nations? So <clears throat> on several, several occasions, I have heard um, Senator Warren talk about wanting to bring this back. Um, she's a firm believer in consultation. And, you know, again, um, traveling the world to hear from Indian country and try to figure out a plan to tackle our issues, you know, again, while having us at the table. So I mean, Ryan can probably elaborate a little bit more, but I know as genuine as she is, she will hear our issues and devise a plan around it if she becomes the president of the United States. And, and just to, to echo that, I mean, I had the fortunate opportunity to attend all of the tribal nations uh, conferences and you know to, to to see that seed planted in the uh, platform that president obama had put put together and see that kind of grow in to to what it was was a, such a profound vision in terms of showing how much good can come from the different uh, policy initiatives that different candidates have and to, for her, of course she's committed to, to reinstituting the Tribal Nations Conference. She's 100% there, but you know, in, in line with her, you know, that's, not, that's not dreaming big enough in, in, in terms of things. So she's, she's you know, dreaming big, fighting hard for us in, in terms of Indian country, in terms of one, she talked about the cabinet level position in, in terms of her administration that she would institute. She talked again in terms of her presentation earlier about the position at OMB and and for policy wonks the position at OMB is really 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 important <laughs> because that's where the money's at and if we have somebody you know within an off a tribal nations office within OMB that puts us in the position of having somebody to track that make sure that the federal government's living up to its treaty and trust responsibility so that's something that she has again identified as something incredibly important for for all of us and so you know she's somebody who is it's fun to sit down and talk to about our issues because unlike a lot of candidates she can go macro to micro in a way that i think is rather unique and rather profound she's somebody who has an incredible amount of passion and reverence for our community and is committed to to doing the right thing you know, it's, it's just really fun to, to see the work that, that she's doing and what she's willing to commit to do. Shannon, do you, do you have another question? I can see your, your legal mind. <laughs> no, just um, um, following up on um, Kevin's question about the um, Wounded Knee um, awarded Medals of Honor. There's also these banners in the Pentagon yeah for each um, war or campaign, and there's a series of Indian wars. Um, we'd like to have those taken down too, just for good measure. Yeah, yeah well, I mean, that, that's not something that we've talked about, but I would, I would say, you know, within her brand and within her kind of message, 
I, I don't think that would be a problem in so terms you know, of yeah, yeah, no, and, a lot of and I think from defense, yeah, but no, 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 and, that needs and, to be done too. Amen, amen, and you know, uh, so the wampum I'm wearing here right now is from the Mashantucket Pequot tribe. So I used to serve, I, I had the blessing of serving as the, the general counsel for the Mashantucket Pequot tribe. And one of the things that they have a lot of frustration about is the, the mural on the Capitol, which is a similar thing in, in terms of there's a massacre on the Capitol wall there and, and, and what have you. So I think those images, and for us as kids, you know, growing up, one of my, you know, I grew up primarily in California, both Southern and Northern California. My first day at kindergarten, my first day at kindergarten, we had show and tell. Johnny came in, talked about their trip and stuff. And um, I talked about a pipe ceremony that Grandpa, Grandpa Ernie did in terms of, uh, you know, that my family was at and talked about that. And I had the profound, <laughs> Um, unfortunate situation of having my kindergarten teacher talk about how Indian people weren't around, Indian people didn't do that. I had a vivid imagination. And um, this is, you know, in the 70s, early 80s. And to sit there and do that, and it, it got worse, because I got, I got sent to, to the state mental health folks to, to get a psychological evaluation. And I, had, I remember being a little kid with my mom, sitting there playing catch with the ball, and doing all these psychological assessments, all these physical assessments. So the images have a profound impact on all of us. And that's something that we all need to remember and we all need to advocate for in terms of protecting our youth. I mean, I've got, I'm, I'm blessed in terms of we have three, three kids and they're all tribal members, both my wife and I are, are, are native. All our families are, are Indian. So, you know, all of that stuff has a profound impact on all of us, and I believe that, you know, she would be in line with me in that regard in terms of standing up and wanting to see stuff like that removed, just like she, she would in terms of the Remove the Stain Act. I have a, a, a follow-up question. We've talked a lot about the budget uh -oh. and, and what full funding is. So what does full funding actually look like? in Indian country for Indian health service or law enforcement and, and you know what does that look like in terms of determining what full funding is and, and what that level should be? I think that's again to, to harken back to what she said in her presentation, full funding. And uh, you know she talks in terms of the broken promises report in, in terms of the need for full funding for for us, so I, I think she was rather clear, eloquent, and committed to, to the commitment for full funding. So I, I, I'm not seeing the vagaries in full funding, at least on, on, on my side of things. I think she was rather clear in terms of her statement on full funding. But if I could also piggyback on that, you know, a lot of us um, tribal leaders are elected to go back and sit on these budget formulation committees, um, you know, National Indian Health budget formulation, BIA budget formulation, and I think our voices need to be heard at that level as well. We are advocating for full funding. We're advocating for advanced appropriations. And the biggest thing is they give us a 36% increase to um, teeter-totter with and play with, but it only ends up being maybe 5% over the um, previous year enacted budget. And to me, full funding our Indian people know what we need, and our voices need to be heard. And when we say we want 100%, let's do a feasibility study to see what exactly that looks like. There's unmet need in all of the programs that we run, and that's where she needs to start with, is listen to our voices around those tables when we make those suggestions, and let's work on a plan together. Great. Um, Adrian, do you have another question? No. How about you, Marlon? I would just ask, in terms of uh, looking at the candidates, I would say Sanders, Warren are the progressive candidates. What, how would you describe the, how would you differentiate between the two? Um, how would I differentiate between the two? Um, and, and, yeah, no, in terms of tribal issues, uh, again, I think I've, you know, I have a rather unique 
perspective in terms of I've done, as the DNC chairman, I've done two uh, tribal leader roundtables with both of them in terms of one we did in Detroit at the Detroit debate and then one we, we did at uh, the California debates more recently. For me, um, I, I think uh, Senator Warren is head and shoulders uh, above the rest, including Bernie in that regard, in terms of being able to go macro to micro, in terms of really having a legal mind and having the understanding and the commitment to, 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 to our needs and how to maneuver through Congress in that regard to get things done on the Senate, the House, and as a, as a president. So the difference between the two there for me is just really the full understanding on the legal issues that impact us. I would say that um, Bernie has a general commitment to us, and so far he hasn't issued a, a platform so far to, on, on this campaign cycle, but um, you know, I think he's uh, done a good job in terms of doing outreach. I commend him for, for that. I thank him for that. I think he, I think um, Senator Warren, Senator Sanders, have, have been the leaders in terms of the outreach for Indian country, where somebody like um, Vice President Biden hasn't done anything. Following up on that, what do you think other candidates like, like Senator Warren can, can do to push other candidates to do more for Indian country, to put out a policy platform, um, to you know, come out and, and make some commitments? I, I would say I think that they've done that. All right, I think Senator Warren has done that. Um, I, you know, at the start of things, um, Julian Castro was the first one to roll out his platform to Indian country. My hands are raised up to him in that regard too, in terms of seeing the value and the commitment of uh, getting out and coming and visiting our communities and being willing to, to advance things in that regard. Uh, I think Senator Warren's platform is head and shoulders above everybody else in, in, in that regard. If you look through it, it's, it's a very long, robust platform. You know, she's, she's an attorney too, I'm an attorney. Maybe we're all brevity challenged, I don't know. <clears throat> but her, her platform is progressive, it's insightful, it's thoughtful, it's dreaming big, it's fighting hard for, for Indian country in, in that regard. And then the other can I think by putting that flag in the ground has caused other candidates like Mayor Pete to put out a platform. Good for him, my hands are up to him too in, in, in that regard. We haven't seen, as I said before, Vice President Biden do anything in that regard. So far, Bernie hasn't put out a platform. Bernie has, though, done the work of consulting with Indian country, meeting with tribal leaders. So I, I, I hope he'll put a, a platform out too in that regard, but I think her willingness to be progressive, be bold, and fight hard for Indian country has really pushed everybody else to do so much more. And I guess just to elaborate on that is, um, if they haven't done it already, then they're not serious about really helping Indian country progress. And again, to me, I think, you know, with your question that you had asked is, the reason why I'm supporting Elizabeth Warren is, I've heard her story. She tells her story over and over and over, and it's genuine. It's from her heart. She speaks from her heart, and she genuinely wants to help Indian country. And, you know, she's been boots on the ground in every field whatsoever. She's been hardworking and worked her way to the top, and she has a humble beginnings, just like a majority of us do and our people do. So that's why I'm putting all of my faith in to pushing her forward and my advocacy and my support, you know, and that's why we're really trying to push, get the native vote out there. We need to stand strong behind somebody because with the current administration, if that were to happen again, it's gonna be detrimental to Indian country. And again, we're here all on the best behalf of our Indian people and we need to get out and vote and make the right choice. Wayne. <laughs> Thanks, you guys, for, You're not gonna for, let me off the hook. for covering for, <laughs> yeah. Um, so one question that our statement, I guess I would make is to make sure that um, Senator Warren, if she is elected, and, and it would be great if she was, I really would like that, but that she ends up making sure that BIA's policies and their CFRs are a regional kind of aspect versus a cookie cutter approach of how they are because some things for the Northern Plains tribes 
really are tied because it may be for an east or west coast more, you know. So I, I really like her to look at that kind of avenue and make sure that she f formulates that. Uh, the other thing is, as an ag producer, think about reinstating cool as soon as possible. Country of origin labeling. Oh. Thank you, though. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Wendy? Um, so, uh, you know, one thing I didn't highlight, too, that she, that she does include in her policy is um, a, a deputy secretary within Interior that would report directly to the secretary. So that's somebody that would be in a position of being able to oversee and play more of a role in terms of like you're talking about, because we are profoundly diverse in terms of us in Indian country. You've got rural tribes, you've got um, urban tribes, you've got tribes that have a little, you have tribes that have a lot, you have tribes in the middle, you have tribes, you know, so we, we aren't a monolith. We are a diverse array of, of tribes and, and, and people that, that have, you know, different needs and, and, and different uh, resources across the country. So I think that position that we talked about right there in terms of that deputy secretary would help uh, in, within her plan to, to address exactly what you're talking about. Does she have a platform, Does she have a platform stance on cool? I'm, I'm not familiar. You're going to have to forgive me on this one. I'm, I'm not familiar with, with cool. That's not in my region, and I, I'm, I'm happy to follow up with you on that, and I apologize for that. Wendy, do you have any questions? So uh, adding on to um, the recognition that our indigenous communities in this country are very diverse, can you talk about Senator Warren's positions with regard to Native Hawaiians? Native Hawaiians, I mean, much like all of us, have uh, been in a position of, you know, not being treated fairly um, in, in that regard. And so, I mean, I, I think she would, she would echo that in, in that regard. I know in terms of, you, uh, we did talk behind stage in terms of Native Hawaiians as well as Alaskan Natives. We did more recently at the round table that we had um, in California also have some Alaskan Natives. We didn't have any Native Hawaiians that were in attendance there, but uh, you know, at the Alaskan Native one, it was very, you know, again, looking at the environmental concerns associated with the environment that we do have in, in terms of Bristol Bay and the like, in terms of the environmental impacts and the, and the salmon that are, you know, being killed off, uh, the pebble mine that they're talking about doing there in that regard and her commitment to, to fight against that stuff and pre and fire informed consent and what have you. So, I mean. Kevin. Thank you, Wizzy. And uh, I guess just to any of the, the Love Warren uh, people, um, you know, I think Ryan, you brought it up where, you know, it, the optics of what you had to go through when you were younger mm -hmm. and, um, you know, just, just, you know, having, knowing that indigenous knowledge and knowing your own ways, you're almost like ostracized and they misdiagnosed to you and all this kind of stuff. But we're kind of in a new time now of where, you know, the narrative around native history is coming up more and more and just correcting that and just you know, really emphasizing that the Warren campaign really lift that up. Um, but also too at the DNC where you know, there's there's really good opportunities to do that because of Wisconsin and some tribal nations and Just really making sure that there's an element of truth and healing because you know I worked with indigenous grandmas in South Dakota around boarding school bill and how they got their rights taken away and everything and that was really painful and where they only had 20 minutes to testify tell their truth and you know, but there was no healing in that process. And I think that's one of the areas in, in the chairwoman, you know, you brought that up as well as making sure that tribes are fully represented at the table in this campaign. So it'd be really good to kind of see that and hear about those elements, so. Thank you. Was there, there a specific question in there that for um, the campaign? Yeah, no, I mean, I'd love to see, you know, see what kind of plans, if there's land acknowledgements gonna be happening at the DNC from the campaign or at least push that uh, just to make sure there's a presence of, you know, like just even an opening. Cause like one of the best things that I've seen, I think, you know, South Dakota might've started this 
of where you know each um, each state introduce themselves and you know South Dakota actually introduced had a native person introduce themselves in Lakota and then every state after that kind of had a native person go up there but even seeing the DNC open up with uh, land acknowledgement would be amazing so yeah. no and uh, I mean I'm on here with the Warren hat but switch over to the DNC hat um, we we did uh, uh, the, the president for, for Ho-Chunk here did attend. Well, the first thing we did was convene on, on the DNC side, convene a meeting with the tribal leadership from Wisconsin in terms of trying to do outreach and make sure we were being as, as inclusive as we could with the, the tribes and, and the home tribes within the state of Wisconsin. So, um, you know, that's definitely something that I've had uh, talks with Tom about in terms and uh, in terms of making sure that our voice and, and our position as the first Americans and the host tribes within the, the community there sh should have a, a strong voice in. Wendy, I, I see you. You were, Marla? Yeah, sure. Um, so as I didn't say earlier, my name is Marlon White Eagle and I'm the president of the Ho-Chunk Nation. We're based in Wisconsin and um, uh, one of the first things that I, I've done, um, I participated in was with our university, our uh, flagship university, University of Wisconsin in Madison. Uh, this, the chancellor there reached out to me. They've done a land recognition on the university and they got a plaque and they're putting it in a permanent location, but also um, in uh, the theater, the Overture Center in Madison, they've also done, prior to the big uh, Hamilton uh, uh, run there at the Overture Center, they've also done a uh, land acknowledgement of the Ho-Chunk people. And even the, uh, um, the city of Madison, they've, they've been really friendly to the Ho-Chunk Nation in terms of land acknowledgement and also Indigenous Peoples Day as well. But, but you can rest assured you have my commitment to, to do everything I can. I mean, I don't carry the, the day, but you have my commitment to stand up for us and make sure our voice is heard around that table. A follow up along some of those, those lines. Um, obviously, you two are here representing the campaign. Are there others, in, in, you know, of course, you know, Representative Holland, but are there others that are you know, kind of officially a part of the campaign or helping to advise uh, the Warren campaign with regard to Indian policy, outreach, et cetera? Um, as far as I know, um, like I said, we, we've got to engage with um, Senator Warren. And again, we do invite her out to uh, a tribal leaders roundtable out in Nevada. But um, as far as I know, Deb Hallen is the... Um, the representative that's advocating and stand behind, standing behind her right now, that I would really take a look at. The, the other, the other person that I would highlight, and I think is a, is a profound step forward for all of us in terms of Indian country. We have a, a young man named Pawi Rivera from the Pueblo of Powake, who is running the campaign in, in Colorado. So we have a tribal member who's heading up a state campaign. I don't know of any other, uh, any other campaign that has a tribal member in that kind of leadership position. I don't think we really have ever had a tribal member in that kind of leadership position to be at the forefront of running a campaign within the state of Colorado. I think we, we all are going to be bettered by that because we'll have a voice and have somebody that we can try to champion someday to, to lead a presidential campaign, to, to lead you know, different campaigns. Those are the steps forward that we need to continue to, to make. And I think Poway has done an incredible job of carrying the water for us within Indian country in that regard. I feel blessed that I've been able to participate and help as well. There's, there's others that are more broadly involved and a lot of tribal leaders in terms of the that she does outreach with and does meetings with she's been you know very very progressive about trying to engage Indian country throughout this process and so I mean if anybody's interested in getting involved please reach out to me reach out to uh, to Poway um, but I'm very proud of the the commitment she's shown in that regard I mean there's 
there's no other tribal member that I'm aware of in a position like Poway, and I think we should all lift him up, and I'll be very, very proud of him and, and, and her commitment to allow him to step out and lead in that regard. So we're being ushered off stage now. Our time is up. But one more uh, kind of follow-up. For anyone who would like to know more information or to contact the campaign to get involved, where do they go? Um, you can look on elizabethwarren.com, but you can also uh, feel free to, to send me an email. Uh, you can email me at uh, ryanramirez at msn.com. That's all one word. I have a funky spelling of my name. My, uh, my parents were hippie Indians, so it's Ryan, like a lion, R-I-O-N, Ramirez. I know. God bless them. Okay, so, our, our, ti our, time, our, our time's up. I was just going to um, make a quick comment. Our time's up. So um, let's uh, go ahead and give a round of applause to our panelists and to the senator. Okay.